It seems like creatives always get a bad rap. From childlike tantrums and ridiculous green room requests, strange superstitions, and even self-mutilation, it's clear that artists have plenty of strange habits. But they've also made a pretty big impact on the world. Hi, I'm Kate Rooney. And I'm Jess Scuffy. And you're listening to Creatives Are the Worst, presented by Design Pickle, the leading flat rate graphic design and creative services platform. In this podcast, we'll be uncovering the fascinating myths and shocking stories behind the artists we love, or in some cases, love to hate, as we try to determine, are creatives the worst? Hello and welcome to Creatives Are the Worst! My name is Kate Rooney, and I'm with the lovely (laughs) Jess Guffey. Hey, Kate. And we just happen to be sitting on my bedroom floor right now. (laughs) We've created a whole portal. We have juju sticks. It's really quite the scene. And we've also endured about two hours of microphone trouble. (laughs) So yeah, it's been a day. Yeah, we normally record this via Zoom. And we had the pleasure of being able to be together this weekend and had very grandiose plans to record and set up candles and get to actually see your face. But then my mic stopped working (laughs) it's just like a sign but we don't know of what so if this episode is really bad you know why (laughs) it's it's the juju sticks they weren't working i got knockoff juju sticks they were working anti us today so it's fine we're gonna come back stronger and better than ever it's fine everything's fine i'm just so happy to see your face it's been right back at you way too long it's been like a month and that's never acceptable it's not okay so yeah yeah get to see another pickler (laughs) up close and personal a pickler yep that's the technical term actually now the reason why we have candles and juju sticks and we're sitting on the floor (laughs) you have a story for me and i do i don't know who you're talking about but i i from what i gather this is a good one well i feel like the build-up has been really just a lot because our producer Arison is also a fan of this person so like we've had a lot of fun kind of uh teasing Kate about who it is and do you have any guesses like no idea no idea idea. so it's important to know like before we actually get into the story and I reveal who we're talking about this person is just uber uber famous like uber well known so it was really really hard to kind of narrow down the story so like For our listeners, there are obviously going to be things that we leave out, and that's intentional, because if we talked about this person forever, it would take, like, days. So we picked our favorite stories, we picked stories that we feel like people don't necessarily know about, and if you have other stories that you want to share with us, please let us know, we want to hear from you on it. Um, But just wanted to call that out, because we're not going to be able to get through every single detail of this person's well, life. I don't even, I'm going to email us and, and <laughs> add more details. So I don't even know who it is. But yeah, definitely email us at podcast at designpickle.com. Yeah. We want to hear all of your insight. Or if you have someone that you want us to cover, let us know. Yes, that too. And it should be noted that this is also just our research. And there's a lot of conflicting information as there is with anyone. So if you know the story and you have facts and you want to share that with us, also reach out to us at podcast at designpickle.com. Yeah, basically let us know how wrong we are about things. That's yeah. what I, I love to hear that. Me too. That's my favorite thing, especially from the internet. That's mm. just... It's, mm, what a time. So... Are you ready? Well, yeah, after trying to deal with this <laughs> mic issue for two hours, I'm ready than ever. Should we do a a quick um like rain dance or something? Like I don't I don't know what this portal really I've is been gonna rain do. Rain dancing for hours. Okay. Okay. So I want you to try to guess. So let's do some word association. And you're just gonna tell me what comes to mind. Symbol. Drums? <laughs> oh, like a, a um, symbol? No, <laughs> I'm not good at this into game. It. Um, rain. Water? <laughs> Purple. <gasps> <laughs> Shut up. No, you are not. Yes, I am. Oh, you're doing prints. Yep. <laughs> symbol? <laughs> That'll become relevant later. Not okay. like a drum symbol. Okay. The other symbol. S Y M B O L. The artist formerly known. Oh, wow! Yes. You're brave. 
Yes. So now you guys know. I mean, if you clicked on this episode, you know. It's really dumb of me to say. But <laughs> now Kate knows why this is such a beast to research yeah. and talk about because holy he has so much about his life. Are you um, ready? I'm he's one of those people where I you know, obviously we know who he is and a yeah. lot about like some of the things you've heard, but I know that you have stuff that like is unheard of. Oh yeah. <gasps> Let's do it. Let's dive right in. So Prince Roger Nelson was born in 1958 in Minnesota to his parents, Maddie Shaw and John Nelson. And they were part of a jo- Jaws. A Jaws? <laughs> a Jaws. A Jazz ensemble. <laughs> God. Hold on. Hold Jaws. On. Jaws saying Jaws. That's <laughs> fitting. Anyways, they were part of a jazz ensemble called the Prince Roger Trio, so his name kind of made sense, kind of was pulled from that. And Maddie, his mom, called his dad Prince, so at first she called Prince Skipper, and then it evolved into Prince. And Did they live on a boat? <laughs> hey, Skipper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. No. Boy. <laughs> no, they lived in Minnesota, so. You know, it is land of lakes, so maybe they, I don't know. Regardless, um... His parents have been quoted saying that Prince developed an affinity for music at a very young age. So they recall when he was like three or four, they'd go to department stores and he would wander off away from his family. And then his mom would always find him in the music department. Like when he was a little, little guy, he just like was so attracted to music. And he also has memories from when he was young and how ingrained music was in his life. And he recalls when he was around eight years old, they tried to put him in music lessons. But his teachers actually hated his guts because he didn't know how to read music, never learned how to read music. And instead of playing what they told him to play, he would just go and play his own stuff, like starting when he was eight years old. Wow. And so the teachers viewed that as defiance, not like, wow, this kid is a savant, <laughs> super gifted. Like, we should <laughs> bolster him up. They were like, dude, you have to like learn the music and play the music. Stick and he was to like, the rules, man. Uh, it didn't really work out for him. He wasn't about that life. So, you know, this went on. He quit music lessons, but he was very talented at basketball. And I don't know if you recall, Kate, but he was very, very short. He wasn't more than, like, five foot one. Oh. Yeah. Five foot one? Yeah. I didn't know he was that much of a nut. Yeah. But he was a very, very talented basketball player, which I think a lot of people don't know. And he had dreams of being an athlete growing up. He would talk to his close friends about it and be like, yeah, I'm going to be a basketball star. Um, and something that he excelled at in basketball outside of the court, but still part of the game was trash talking. That's like what he became known for. <laughs> <laughs> so he was super good and his talent backed it up, but he was really, really good at trash talking with people. Nice. I wish I was better at that. <laughs> Same. So his close friends described him as very extroverted with close friends, but outside of that, he was often known to be very shy and introverted, so in larger groups of people that he didn't know, like, very reserved, just kind of observed everything else. But, you know, he kind of lived an interesting childhood, so his dad first caught him with a girl when he was 12 years old, and it really sets the stage, right? Like, everything you know about Prince, it's like, oh, this is all starting to click into place. But he allegedly learned about the birds and the bees from a drive-in movie oh. not from his own parents <laughs> um yeah I, I, yeah think about it no one talked about that totally That's, yeah it makes sense I wonder what movie it was i know so he ran away from home at this age and went to live with his friend and it's important to note that like his relationship with his parents was there are a lot of conflicting reports about what it was. I mean, some say he was super close with them. Some say he had a tough relationship with his dad. Like, we don't really, really know Mm -hmm. other than they were very important to him. So take that for what it's worth. I, we really don't know the true depth of that. Okay. But back to the music part, he didn't show the actual obsession. I mean, obviously he was involved with girls and sports and all that stuff. His friends. Seems like fairly normal up to yeah, until this point. Totally. He didn't start really showing his music obsession until his teens, where he started rehearsing for hours. He taught himself how to play the piano, drums, guitar. Like, that's when he really started becoming... He Prince. started beating those cymbals. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't think you beat cymbals. I think that's not the proper term. Tap them? Tap, tap those cymbals? Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Sure. sure. So, he goes on to form a band called Grand Central, and 
it's rather insignificant, but it's significant in that they were credited with forming the Minneapolis sound, which was a hybrid of rock, pop, and funk, and it had a lot of sexual undertones and, for that matter, overtones. So it was just like a different type of music that people hadn't really heard of before. Mm -hmm. And he was pretty young at this point. I mean, he's just starting out, and they were able to develop their own sound, so that's pretty cool. Uh, In 1975, he signed his first solo contract with Warner Bros., and... He was insistent on, before he signed the contract, he wanted it in there that he would be able to produce all of his own albums and play all of his own instruments. Like, he did not want input from other people, he did not want other musicians, he wanted complete control over mm-hmm. his albums. And one of his producers actually recalled that Prince would require him to turn off the light when he was singing because he was so shy and introverted that he, like, could not have other people watch him at this time. I mean, he's still super young, like... Yeah, he's still feeling feeling things out yep and yep so he was really really shy and they tried to figure out an image that they could curate that kind of played into his personality but also like positioned him as a star so one of his managers at the time was like let's do the whole less is more thing right like let's take him for what he is and then just bolster that a little bit so in LA at the time jeans and boots were like the biggest fashion that's what everyone was wearing so they were like Let's style prints in three piece suits and we'll all wear three piece suits. Ooh, <laughs> Which we know. Style. Yeah, yeah. He always had good style. So, 1978, he released his first album, which is called For You. And it was a moderate success, nothing to write home about, but it was his first album. And obviously, that's monumental for him. Is, is it like a he's a solo artist at this point, or does he have a band that he's. It's just Prince. Okay. Yeah. And he, on this record, he played every single instrument that's heard, and it was rumored at this time, this is like when rumors started building up around him, that he had been able to play over 27 different instruments, all wow. self-taught. And I could literally list them all, but I don't even know what some of them are. <laughs> so we're not going to do that. Just use your imagination. <laughs> <laughs> the kazoo. Probably. So in 1979, he appeared on American Bandstand, and this is his biggest exposure at this point. Like, People started getting to know him. He was doing various gigs, but American Bandstand in the 70s was massive. Mm -hmm. So he kind of started developing his on-air persona at this point, and host Dick Clark was really excited to have him on the show, started asking him questions, and Prince only responded with nonverbal or like super succinct responses on the air, and he did this on purpose. And Dick Clark was just kind of like... Is Who is this guy? Yeah, he's still super young. Like, what is going on here? So that was the first time people saw him on air and were like, hmm, this is this is interesting, but okay. So we go to 1980. He released his third album called Dirty Mind at this time. And this started cementing his reputation as explicitly sexual. <gasps> That's where he really runs with it here. Uh-huh. It mm-hmm. was a critical success, but because it was so explicitly sexual, it caught a lot of people off guard. And it was very, very innovative. Like That's why it was a critical su- success, is because it was a different sound. It was like nothing people had heard before. But it also started causing some controversy because people were like, what is this dude singing about? I mean, this is... That reminds me of the scene from Back to the Future where they're like, trust us, you're going to love this. Your kids are going to love this. Oh my (laughs) gosh, yes! (laughs) You're just not used to the sound, but... That's exactly it. Yeah, and then think about the music we have today. I mean, it's obviously... Wop? Which I I still haven't listened to that. Yep. We were supposed to play that, but before we (sighs) got stuck with these mic issues... Too many tech issues... So anyways, 1991, his album, appropriately titled Controversy, Mm -hmm. is released. On the nose there. uh Uh-huh. This left fans wondering about his sexuality. So a lot of weird things going on in lyrics here. Obviously, Prince is very intentional about everything he did at this time and throughout his whole career, but he did this for a reason. And it caught the attention of the Rolling Stones, who obviously were huge at this time, and they asked him to open for them at two shows in L.A., so back-to-back shows. They were at the Coliseum, 110,000 people, really, really big deal. Prince comes out, he's wearing a bikini and a trench coat. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Just let that let that visual sink in. Yeah, like that's what I wear on a Tuesday. For when you need to uh, sell some watches, but then you have to head to the beach right after. (laughs) Exactly. So fans were getting a little restless, and I think 
you know, the 80s were a different time. I think they were like, what is this guy doing? And they started throwing things at him on stage. Oh, no. Just hateful things. Just not not nice. So he disappeared. He ran away. That is not rock and roll. I'm sorry. No. Don't be mean. That's not. Yeah. It's, it's really sad, honestly. So that night he flew back to Minnesota because he was so shaken up at what happened. And Mick Jagger kept trying to call him, but Prince was not answering. He was like, nope, done with this. Until his guitarist, Des Dickerson at the time, got a hold of him and told him that he used to play at biker bars as a black man. And he reminded Prince that you don't let people run you out of town. Like, you have to stand your ground, you have to celebrate who you are, and you don't let other people dictate who that is. Really good advice. So Des was able to convince Prince to return for night two, which... Like, that's so nice. He was like, dude, you can do this. We got you. It's so he right. flew back home and then flew back to flew L.A. back to L.A. and then performed night two. So he went out again, same getup, same set list, and someone threw a fifth of Jack at his head. <gasps> um, another person threw a jug of orange juice at the bass player. Like, just all sorts of terrible things Why happening. do you have orange juice at... The Coliseum. First of all, how do you take a jug of orange juice into a concert? I guess different times back then, but what in the world? Like, just gonna bring this jug of orange juice. You know what sounds really good right now? Some vitamin C. <laughs> and some rock and roll. <laughs> and the stones, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't really get it. Oh, but people are the worst. They are. So they got through the set, and the band considered this a pivotal moment for Prince and his persona and bravado. So, like, because he was able to get through this, people were like, oh, he can kind of get through anything. So this is when he formed the band Time with his bandmate from his original band, if you call Grand Central. So he has bands now with him. In 1982, uh, the famous album 1999 was released. We all know this one. And Prince was quoted at this time in a Rolling Stone interview saying, The reason I don't use musicians a lot of the time had to do with the hours that I worked. I swear to God, it's not out of boldness when I say this, but there's not a person around who can stay awake as long as I can. Music is what keeps me awake. Not the drugs. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Uh, I will say that, I mean, we've only recorded a couple episodes, but there's definitely a common thread here with people who want to really, really be in control of the creative process and Mm -hmm. that, that need to like, it's just me. I, no one else can contribute to this. No one can keep up with me. And I don't think it's ever from a malicious place. It's more like they just are so passionate about every single note being right or every single creative input being right that they just would rather do it themselves because they feel like they know best yeah when you envision something that's art whether it's music painting whatever you can like see it in your mind's eye and having to work with other people you're trying to explain this vision but no one's ever gonna see it exactly how you see it or hear it so exactly fascinating makes sense so at this time his recording sessions lasted about 12 to 15 hours and he just kept drinking coffee he wouldn't eat because he thought it would make him tired So coffee only diet and others confirm this. Like so many people in his life have been like, yeah, he would cook for us. He can only cook eggs, but he would never eat the eggs himself. Like that was like a common anecdote about his life. Eggs. Just eggs. (laughs) Omelets specifically. So his sound engineer, Peggy McCreary at this time, was quoted saying he was hard to work for. He was demanding. He was relentless. You had to be ready at any time for anything that inspired him. It was tough. I was on call whenever he was in California. I once asked, do you like my work? And he said, you're here, aren't you? (gasps) With one sentence, he could rip you to the bone. Savage. Yeah, like, just a little different than what you would expect, right? Uh Uh-huh. So on her birthday that year, he called her into the studio and she was like, oh my God, again, like we just got done in the studio. I was looking forward to actually celebrating my birthday. And he was dressed super casually and he threw her a cassette tape and it was an unreleased song. So to him, that was one of the best gifts that he ever (laughs) could give anyone. And he often used unreleased impromptu songs that he recorded as his love language for people. So that was how he expressed his love. Interesting. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like a, a a personal gift from the heart, I guess, because yeah. something you handmade. It's so one of speak. a time. One of a kind. One of one a time. Of a time. <laughs> one of a kind. 
But yeah, around this time too, it was noted by people that knew him that he allegedly had one response whenever someone would approach him on the street to comment on his music, good or bad. Um, but obviously people had a lot of thoughts. We talked about how it was a little controversial and his image was a little controversial. So people had a lot of thoughts when they would approach him and his response every single time was apparently, yeah, well, what are you doing? <laughs> I love that. It's savage in the best yeah. way. Like, what are you doing? What do people say to that? Like, uh, oh uh, man, uh, like, I'm a marketing uh, manager. Like, I don't much. know, bro. <laughs> Compared to you, I don't know. So, yeah, I liked that little nugget because I can picture the whole thing. <laughs> Being uh, like, uh, someone just like, uh, 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 I don't uh, even. Yeah, but. just moonwalk away from it. <laughs> that conversation, classic. So, 1983 rolls around, and Prince had been writing movie ideas down for a while. Like he had this idea in his head that he wanted to make his acting debut. So this was kind of like something that he was hyper focused on at this time, and he refused to sign a new contract with his management firm until they got him a movie. Uh, he was quoted saying, "And it can't be financed by some drug dealer or jeweler, and it has to be a major studio, and my name has to be above the title." So, like, he had a very specific vision for how he wanted this movie to go. There was a lot of mystery around the actual movie itself, and they eventually, his management firm was able to pair him with filmmaker Al Magnoli. I think that's how you say it. But no one else knew what the movie was going to be about. Like, they started shooting it somewhat randomly. People close to him were constantly asked by the press, what's going on? We hear he's doing a movie. And no one knew. Like, it was just a huge mystery. So... Rumor has it he wanted to have a dramatized version of his father as a prominent figure in the movie, and the speculation at that time was he was such a control freak because of his dad. And now we don't know more details about that. That's just kind of like how people were perceiving this whole process. Some speculation here. Yes. Okay. Um, the movie ended up being filmed in the fall of 1983, and apparently everyone in it came up with their own parts. <laughs> Uh, how <laughs> yeah like I, again allegedly we don't know for sure but that's that's word on the street um he obviously was writing the soundtrack for this film as well and he was really good friends with stevie nicks oh bless yes sent her a 10 minute instrumental and asked her to write lyrics for it and she was too overwhelmed by it when she listened to it and she was like hey i think this is great but for me it's just like too much and i don't feel comfortable writing the lyrics so she sent it back to oh, him stevie nicks yeah and then he ended up writing the lyrics, and it became known as Purple Rain. Exactly. Oh. I love that. Like, who knew that she was involved in that? Oh, I got chills. I know. Ooh. So, like, had she written the lyrics, Purple Rain might have never existed. Wow. Yeah. Things really do work out for a reason. The butterfly effect. So, in 1984, in May, he released When Doves Cry off the Purple Rain album. <laughs> And it was his first number one pop hit. I love that song. It's so good. It reminds me of Romeo and Juliet, mm -hmm. the movie. Yeah. It's so good. And then this album also had Let's Go Crazy, which was the first time that Sheila E. appeared on one of his songs. Then the movie was released, and it was number one at the box office. So it was filmed with a $7 million budget, and it made $70 million at the box office. As we all know, Purple Rain won the best original song at the Oscars. The album won two Grammys, and it stayed at the top of the charts for six months. Have you watched the movie? I have not ever watched it. My Neither. parents yell at me for it. They're like, you would love it. <laughs> we might have to watch it I think we tonight might have to. or something. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I've heard it's fantastic. So as we can imagine, this whole experience catapulted him to ridiculous levels of fame. Like before he was successful and people knew who he was. But he this knew Stevie like, Nicks. So. Yeah, but this was like Hollywood fame, like a whole other level. Um, so he started playing week-long synths at some of the biggest venues in the country. He had guests on stage like Bruce Springsteen and Madonna. Um, according to his tour manager, he had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of outfits, and each outfit had its own matching pair of boots. So much so that they went and found this theatrical boot designer in New York. He was an Italian guy. And they were like, hey, we need you to like make boots for prints. And he was like, I'm really sorry, but I have a whole list of orders that I need to get through. And they were like, no, no, you don't understand. We will pay you to stop all your other projects and just work on boots for prints. And the guy was like, all right. You're making boots for prints now. Guess that's my life now. I, I'm sure the guy who threw orange juice at prints feels real bad now mm -hmm. at this point, regretting that decision. 
But in typical creative fashion, he didn't love this. He didn't love this whole new perception of him because he felt like it pigeonholed him into a very specific persona. And he was like, I don't want to do this forever. And I, I don't know exactly, like, I was trying to think about it when I was doing research. What did he hate so much about it? Because if you're making music, obviously you want to be famous to some degree and be successful. So, like, now you're at the top of your game. You're Hollywood famous. Is it the public eye that you don't like being in? I mean, he was classically private, but... Yeah, I think it. I could see that feeling of being pigeonholed because then at that level of fame, if you do anything different, it becomes exactly. such a discussion point. Everyone's going, going to scrutinize everything that you do. And that's why we see a lot of like pop stars and stuff, quote unquote, reinventing themselves mm-hmm. because that's the only way that they can break free from that totally. persona that people, gl- they think that they know these famous people because of these personas, but right. really people are multidimensional and... That's so true. And just from a music perspective, I mean, When Doves Cry, Let's Go Crazy, Purple Rain, like, those are such iconic songs. He probably felt like, well, shit, how am I going to top these? Like, Yeah, so much pressure. There's also a weird little anecdote about Al Gore's wife ended up causing a little bit of a ruckus. Like, she really liked the album. She was listening to it. But then she got to a certain song and the lyrics really pissed her off. So his albums from then on started being labeled with parental advisory stickers. Oh. Of oh <laughs> yeah wow okay yeah uh, so we get to 1985 prince is labeled as arrogant now he was asked to join michael jackson at the recording of we are the world which was for africa big deal and he didn't want to do it he was overwhelmed by that many people being a studio with him at the same time like but he didn't really say that to the public at the time he was just like no i'm not doing it well so, that's a project that you have zero control over you're just there to yep. sing what they tell you to sing and yep so it makes sense but people just ripped him apart for it they were like you are the worst and blah blah, blah. and then this is also the same time that his former bodyguard dropped an expose in the national Enquirer. really really solid piece of news source yeah um but it painted him as a quote freakish insomniac workaholic who lived like a hermit i mean that's not wrong (laughs) but that's mean that's i mean also why are you going to the national Enquirer? like is that the best you could do with something like that i mean sorry with the vampire baby story wasn't getting enough traction or exactly it's just that's shady man and if i were prince i'd be so hurt by that if someone that used to work for me close to you doing that that's a bummer So this and the We Are the World thing led to more and more bad press, and he was getting really overwhelmed by it, and he was trying to change his vibe anyways in response to the pigeonholing from Purple Rain. So he released Around the World in a Day, and it did not perform well at all. So this kind of sent him into a little bit of a downward spiral, and he quit touring, went back to Minneapolis, and was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start building a home and a studio complex. Hmm. Just completely, completely shifting gears. So by 1986, he directed himself in a second movie because he liked doing the first one so much. And it was called Under the Cherry Moon. Not surprisingly, because I have never heard of this, and I'm sure a lot of people have it. I was going to say, I've never heard of them before. It absolutely flopped. Oh, so it still, like, happened. Yeah. Okay. Which I also want to look it up because I want to see if it's good or not. (laughs) So... On the set of this, Michael Jackson showed up at the soundstage in L.A. when they were recording. They both had their bodyguards there. And I don't really know why Michael showed up in the first place. Like, I don't know if he was just passing by to say what's up to Prince, especially after the We Are the World thing. I I don't really know what the deal was there. But regardless, he shows up and Prince is like, you want to play some ping pong? And Michael doesn't know how to play ping pong, but they do it anyways. So they start playing, and the whole crew drops everything and comes over to watch them play, right? So they have a whole crowd, and they're playing and playing, and, you know, Michael's not very good. He's never played before. And Prince goes, you want me to slam it? (gasps) And Michael, like, doesn't really respond, but covers his face. So then Prince slams it, and Michael just walks out with his bodyguards, and that's, like, the end of their game. And then Prince turns to the whole crew and says, quote, did you see that? He played like Helen Keller. <laughs> <laughs> Explain my face right now. <laughs> Kate's jaw is so far on the ground that we're going to need to shovel the I was not ready for that savage of a yeah. retort. What? Yeah. 
he played like Helen Keller, which when I first read this, I was cackling. Like, I just think that is so funny. And there are so many stories about Prince and playing ping pong with people. Like, he was an avid ping pong player. Loved well, it. Well, actually, Jess, the, the correct term is table tennis. Oh, I'm so sorry table tennis player he was an exceptional table tennis player um again going back to the, his athleticism like oh, he was athletic right. his whole life and he just really and really he's little so he can move really quickly yeah the, the table tennis exactly table. jimmy fallon actually has a really good um, ping pong story with prince as well but he it was a big part of his life which is kind of funny and it's totally different than his persona <laughs> so no, i had no idea yeah love that story but yeah, this movie sucked, allegedly. I've never seen it, so I can't fully comment on that, but it flopped in the box office. And the only good part about it was that the accompanying album that he wrote for it, Parade, had the song Kiss on it, which, as we know, was one of his biggest hits. It was his third number one hit. And he actually wrote that song originally for someone else. That's what it was intended for. But he kept it because he liked it so much. And he was like, actually, I'm going to record this. Wait a minute. And he obviously did the right thing because we all know that song. It's iconic as hell. So around this time, people were commenting that knew him really close. They said he was noticeably happier and he started getting sleeker around this time, was showing some visible growth and desire to have a hand on all aspects of his creative career. So I think it's funny that it was noted then because it seems like he always had that. But I think people noticed that he was trying to make movies and do all these other things that he just really wanted to like be involved in as many creative ventures as he possibly could. He wanted to create. He wanted to create. This is also when he wrote Manic Monday for the Bangles, another iconic song. I didn't know that he wrote that. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Yep. Another classic. Another classic, for sure. He's one of those people that you don't realize how many songs he actually wrote as well as performed and had hits of his own. Um, This is also the year that it was his last show with The Revolution, which was his band at the time. It was in September in Japan in 1986. And he had, like, an inexplicable meltdown then, so he broke his Purple Rain guitar on purpose and fired everyone from the band. As one does. As one does. I don't really have other details. That's just, like, how everyone recalled Mm. it going down. They were like, oh, we're playing our last show, and he's like, I don't want this guitar anymore, slams it, and then fires everyone, so. He was having a bad day. Yeah, we're just going to chalk it up to that. So, in 1987, he reconstructs the band, he releases Sign of the Times, Sheila E. is on the drums, things are going well, Sheila E. is a badass, we could cover her in another episode. Um, So, with this album, they were touring in Europe for two and a half months, and things were going really well. Like, the album was a critical success, people were receiving it really well, people were excited about it, and then out of nowhere, (laughs) he decides he does not want to tour in the U.S. because he wants to make another movie. Oh, no way. Yeah. So, like, they had all this momentum, and things were, like, really cruising along. And then once he decided he didn't want to turn the U.S., the album just, like, stopped selling because... Oh, he wasn't focused on it. He wanted to... I wonder what his fascination about film was. I don't know. I've thought about that, too. It's, like, is it the seeing yourself on the screen part? Like, was it the ego? Uh wanting to be in Hollywood, but he was so private. Like, I can't really figure it out. Maybe just being so different creatively, like, music came so easy to him. Well, and it sounds like all of the movies that he's creating, they they have albums connected to them, so it's almost like an extension. Making the music isn't enough. There has to be sets and costumes and stuff like that. I mean, if you think about his tours and, like, his performances, they all had a theatrical element to them. So, like, maybe he viewed a movie as a step up and just, like, it fulfilled him more to be able to make it a whole production and a legitimate set. Cool. I don't know. Um, it was also this year that he officially opened Paisley Park, which was his 65,000 square foot home and recording studio that he had been working on a few years prior because he thought he could make movies there. I know it's shocking. <laughs> <laughs> No, I had no idea he was this into creating a film studio. Yeah. This year, an article by the Star Tribune also says, artistically, Prince was restless at this time. Even though he had chart success with the song Sign of the Times and You Got the Look, a duet with Sheena Easton, he was no longer on top of the music world. He decided to make an underground recording, which, sidebar, we know is the Black Album now. Then, with more than 400,000 copies ready to be shipped, he paid to cancel its release. No explanation. He paid to cancel mm-hmm. it? That's a step beyond. Uh-huh. 
So just kind of like a little all over the place. Who is the pickle's favorite artist? I don't know. It's Salvador Dilly. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, okay, that that joke was the worst, but you know what's not the worst? Design Pickles Flat Rate Unlimited Creative Services. No, it is not the worst with Adobe source files included, brand profiles, unlimited users, smart designer match. We could go on and on all day. There's a reason why Design Pickles ranked on the Inc. 5000 two years in a row. And you know what else isn't the worst? If you're listening to this podcast, you get $100 off your first month of any plan if you use the code WORST at checkout. It's Woo! pretty nice. Yeah. Use checkout code WORST. It's W-O-R-S-T, all caps. And you can get $100 off uh, any plan. So Essentials, our pro plan, our custom illustrations plan. Start creating. It's awesome. And it's so fast. And we love it so much. And we're back. So just to recap, he was not on top of the music world anymore, according to people. So in 1988, he releases Love Sexy, <laughs> which was notorious for the nude cover of the album. Yeah. Him? Uh-huh. Okay. Mm-hmm. And many people consider this a turning point in his career, so we kind of see the buildup of it, but people started to say that he was becoming less and less marketable, so like wasn't as commercially successful or appealing to people at this point. But I wonder if he even cared about that, because he <sighs> wanted... Well, yeah. We'll see. So he tried to come back, and he kind of felt this. He tried to come back with an ambitious tour schedule. He was working insane hours recording and touring at this point, like just completely burning the candle at both ends, which isn't surprising given his what we know about him thus far. Coffee and eggs. He said in an interview around this time, people call me a workaholic, but I've always considered that a compliment. John Coltrane played the saxophone 12 hours a day. That's not a maniac. That's a dedicated musician whose spirit drives his body to work so hard. I think that's something to aspire to. People say that I take myself too seriously. I consider that a compliment, too. Okay. Certainly a creative. Certainly. <laughs> it's a very creative thing to say. Um, this is also around the time that he was first showing signs of financial pressure. They were spending so much, but they weren't making Purple Rain money anymore. And he was trying to outdo himself. Like, he was trying to make a comeback, so everything was getting more and more extravagant. The sets on his tour were getting more extravagant. The clothes were getting more extravagant. Like, they were spending the money that they didn't necessarily have coming in. And he always... Fun little fact about this time as well he always had to have a baby grand piano in his hotel room like no matter where he was in the world i have heard that before uh-huh so when they were in london he was staying in the presidential suite of a hotel and he wanted the baby grand piano in there and they were like well we can't fit it up the elevator so like how else do you want us to get it in there and he was like i don't care what you have to do just get it in the room well they ended up having to use a crane to lift the piano and put it into the room and they did this without even looking at the bill, what it was going to cost them, whatever, because they were like, well, Prince wants it. So, again, more financial trouble, potentially, from this. Well, to get a crane. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just for the piano. Which, like, he clearly is someone that needed the outlet constantly, and he wasn't sleeping, so what else are you going to do? I feel like if he didn't have a piano, he'd pace around. Well, couldn't he have just put a different instrument that fits through doors instead? Like a guitar, perhaps? Like a flute? Even better. Piccolos yeah. are really small. <laughs> you could do that. A triangle, even? Didn't fulfill them. Put it, him put it in, in your pocket. Way. Yeah. So it had to be a piano. Hmm. But around this time, he formed Paisley Park Record Label with Warner Bros. So it was like a collaboration project that they did. And Paisley Park produced albums by Shaka Khan, Mavis Staples, Carmen Electra. People like the Bee Gees, Jeff Beck, Steve Miller, Stevie Wonder, Bonnie Raitt, they all came to Paisley Park to record. MC Hammer even recorded a commercial there, so it was being used as like a film studio, a commercial studio, stuff like that as well. So they were making good use of the 65,000 square foot. This is the one in, in Minneapolis? Correct. Okay. And the studio director, Tom Tucker, was quoted saying at this time, it was a fun pressure cooker out there. There was an intense creativity. When he was around in the studio or there were other artists in the studio, I could easily work 80 to 100 hour weeks, but I was okay with that. At least they had a heated parking garage. 
<laughs> oddly specific. <laughs> oddly specific. Like, well, I'm working 100 hour weeks and don't have a wife, but at least there's a heated parking garage. There is something really kind of magical about that when you get into that flow state of creation when you're mm-hmm. you're kind of like locked in a room we we've experienced this at design pickle i mean no one ever locked us into a room to be clear <laughs> but you know going to like retreat where we're just focused on coming up with new ideas and yep. everything and just that there's magic that happens when people are just focusing on that there's no distractions and you're working with like wildly creative people 100 percent, and i think I mean, everyone feeds off it. Like, it doesn't matter if you're not the most creative person. I think if you're around other people that are creative, like, you're inspired to Mm -hmm. start creating as well. So because they had all these albums being produced and guests coming in to record and people buying out the studios to produce commercials, they actually started paying for the vast overhead. And it fueled, not surprisingly, Prince's creativity to have so many other successful artists around and so many iconic people like Shaka Khan and, you know, all these legendary musicians. He was incredibly prolific during this time, too. Someone in his circle said by the time he released an album, he would have 10 other al- albums lying around. Like, that's how much he was creating. Albums, not even just yeah. songs. Just albums. Huh. Yeah. Insane. Um, this is also around the time that his team tried to convince him to digitize the unreleased music in his vault. And he was going to, but then he pulled the plug because he realized he didn't want anyone to hear it. Like, there's a reason it was in the vault in his mind. Which I thought was really interesting. <laughs> in the vault. In the vault. So he started to get back to the public eye um, when he was hired to do the soundtrack for Batman. And I didn't know this, but he was hired at the recommendation of Jack Nicholson to write the soundtrack for Batman. So this must, which Batman is this? Because Jack Nicholson is the. I think it's Michael Keaton, yeah? Jack Nicholson is the. He's the Joker, right? Mm hmm. Uh, yeah uh jack nicholson another person we will have to cover someday yes. fascinating human being i'm not i'm not surprised that he yeah you know suggested prince for this he was but a I huge fan mm-hmm. He was a huge fan and he was like we should hire him to do the soundtrack i think it'd be a really good vibe and it worked because prince was back in the public eye like there was a really prominent song off this and Yada yada. <laughs> so this is also where he met Kim Basinger, and he was on set with her. Just you know, didn't soundtrack. She was in the movie. She actually ended up quitting Hollywood to move to Paisley Park with him. And the biggest controversy that they sparked when they were together was they recorded an album, and her vocals were on it. And the vocals were allegedly recorded while they were having sex. <gasps> yeah. Was she actually singing or just making guttural sounds? <laughs> <laughs> Unclear. Um, but, like, whether they did that just to rile people up or it was actually true, we don't really know. But it it's caused urban legend. quite the controversy in the mm. world. But their relationship ended after a year, and her family said that they had to basically kidnap her from Paisley Park while he was out of town, which is a pretty aggressive thing to say. Like, there are a lot of stories about Prince with women, but no one ever said that he made them feel, like, creeped out or unsafe or anything Hmm. like that. So I think that was a little aggressive of them. Maybe they just were mad at her for living in Minnesota. Who knows? But I thought that was a weird little little aside yeah, about that relationship kidnap someone from yeah well he was out of town like that makes him sound a little menacing mm-hmm. in my opinion but we don't know so 1990 rolls around and you guessed it he tries to make another movie oh, my <laughs> days. yeah uh, uh, yeah beyond uh, purple rain i didn't know that there was neither did i anything This one was called Graffiti Bridge. He tried to reunite with his band Time, but the whole thing fell flat. It did lead to him forming a new band, though, called New Power Generation, and this was all with, like, young, up-and-coming musicians, which he was really excited about. So in 1991, he releases Diamonds and Pearls, the album, and it was the most commercially successful album since Sign of the Times. Now, this is interesting because this album was specifically referenced as being way more collaborative creatively than any of his other albums. So as you recall, he said, I only want to play the music and I only want to do the instruments. But in this one, members of New Power Generation 
have been quoted saying like, yeah, we would all just throw out different ideas and it was more of like a, a group effort to create the album, which I thought was very interesting. Well, and you said that he chose up and coming artists or people who weren't already commercially recognized. That to, to hear that he refused to, to sing with Michael Jackson, We Are the World, but he is willing to take on new creatives. That's, mm-hmm. I, I think that's pretty cool in its own weird way. I do too. And I think he felt a lot of like kinship with young musicians because he didn't forget that he was that at one point. <laughs> or he just preferred to have control and so he knew it would be easier to control people who are looking up to him versus <laughs> his True. peers. Who but knows? It, it worked in the opposite way because they were so collaborative and, you know, a lot of the people that were playing the instruments actually suggested those parts that they oh, okay. played and stuff like that. So take it for what you will. I don't know. Um, but he was still considered a little bit controversial at this time. There's a great story from Alan Edwards, who is his publicist for a while. So Alan tells the story that he got a call from a very big PR firm in the U.S., and he flew out to Minnesota in the middle of winter. They flew him out. He was shown to a suspended room made of glass. He wasn't offered anything to eat, drink. No one spoke to him. He was just shown to this room of glass. Now, out of nowhere, as he's sitting in this room doing nothing, Prince music starts blasting. Okay? And Alan said that he felt like people were watching him. So he he tried to give them the reaction that he thought and expected they were looking for so he was like tapping his foot and like trying to actively show that he was into the music because he got what was going on a little bit of time goes by the receptionist comes in to grab him puts him in a car (laughs) again no one has spoken to him yet at this point i'm bewildered right now i have no idea where this is going yeah and then the driver just randomly starts asking him what he thought of the album. And again, Alan's not an idiot. He's like, oh, this is again a trap. Like, I, I know that this is going to get back to Prince. So he's like, oh, I think it was fantastic and blah, 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 blah. Goes on his way. That's it. Three days later, he was hired. <laughs> oh, oh, so he wasn't working for Prince already before this. No. I thought at this point he was already his publicist, but the... Uh, he was working with other <laughs> famous musicians, and evidently that caught Prince's eye. They flew him out to Minnesota, put him in the glass room, sent him on his way. Like Wow. And then three days later, after not anyone spoke a peep other than the driver, they're like, okay, Prince Prince wants you on his team. You're hired. <laughs> yeah. That's creepy. That's to put someone through a test like that. No explanation. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So Alan Edwards also had a you know, in this article that he was speaking on all these things, and he mentioned that he had a special phone number just for him so that Prince could call him on it. And that was part of Prince's paranoia with the press. Like, he did not like doing interviews. He refused to do interviews for a very long time. Uh, Journalists were never allowed to record interviews. So if he did do one, they basically had to memorize everything he said, and they weren't allowed to write it down or record it. So, yeah. (laughs) I, I don't know what you're supposed to do in that situation as a journalist because it's like, yeah, I want to interview Prince, but I'm going to be so stressed trying to remember everything. And then what if I mess something up? So it was on the record still. They just couldn't notate it in any way. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's a recipe for disaster because people have very unreliant memories. <laughs> exactly. So this particular story with Alan Edwards, like once he put that out into the universe after they stopped working together it gave prince the reputation of being relentless and intimidating and again played into the whole control freak persona which for good reason like you're being put in a suspended glass room (laughs) and like what are you a zoo animal i just i can't even imagine being in that situation it reminds me of a a black mirror episode right how freaky would that be you go into a glass room no explanation all of a sudden music starts playing you feel like people are watching Mm -hmm. you yeah like at least it's prince music so it's good music but you're like yeah but still uh, am i supposed to like dance to myself like what am i what What would you do if you were in that situation i feel like i would be deeply uncomfortable but i feel like i would probably do what alan edwards did and i would know that people were watching so i'd try to like show that i was enthusiastic about the music in some way because if you're there to get hired i'd probably have a panic attack and lie down on the floor I mean that too. It depends on how big the room is. If it's a small room, I don't I don't know how well that would go for me. But 
yeah. Anyways, so it, it's just an interesting little anecdote about how he was treating people in his circle at that time. And Alan wasn't even in his circle, but like they were testing him to be in the circle and there was a rigorous test, which, you know, now that I say that out loud, I get why you do that to some people because you want to see what they're made of and, you know, you're only trusting certain people. So yeah, more about the, the trust thing. If you're that level of celebrity, how do you make sure that someone isn't just going to double cross you or take advantage of you? Exactly. So put him in a glass room, put him in a glass room. <laughs> in 1993, Prince was super upset with Warner Bros and their release tactics. He was upset about money and the musical output. And he was also really, really upset. This is the number one thing that pissed him off. He didn't know that Warner Brothers owned the originals of all of his releases. Like, he just didn't know. And when he found out, he was so upset because... How do you not know that, though? (laughs) I think his managers and, like, everyone around him just always kind of protected that fact because it was so standard. And unfortunately, it still is standard in the musical industry. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, like he didn't know that so he found out and he freaked out and on top of that they had a bunch of other stuff going on that he wasn't happy with so this is when he changed his name into a symbol this is when it ha- i was wondering when you were gonna get to that yeah he changed his name into a symbol i would try to explain it but i think everyone knows to some degree what it looks like it's like the gender signs kind of skewed. It's just look it up. <laughs> You'll see what just, we mean. Just Google it. Just Google it. Um, he did this because he was quote following the advice of his spirit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, aren't most people doing that? I guess I. I don't really know, but he also started releasing songs independently at this time, and he would appear in public with the word "slave" on his cheek. What? Yeah, and he was quoted when people started asking him like. You, why are you appearing with slave on your cheek? It's a bit much. He said, Now Prince is dead. They've killed him. I don't own Prince's music. If you don't own your own masters, your master owns you. I get the sentiment, but uh, you were not a. Okay, sorry. Carry on. Yeah. Carry on. Uh, and people described him like he was genuinely hurt by this. It wasn't just an act. Like he was deeply, deeply wounded that he felt like he'd been bam- bamboozled and not yeah. been told the truth. And I get that. I oh, mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. If people are protecting you and you don't know what's going on, and then all of a sudden you find out 10 years later and you're like, um. Well, and then it, his whole thing is like having control and creative control. And then you find out. Yeah. You you never had it all along. Dun, dun, dun. Oh. Yeah. Kind of brutal. So 1994, things were behind financially. It was discovered that he was paying mortgages for a lot of people around Minnesota, uh, specifically young musicians. Hmm. So again, like wasn't really paying attention to what was going out. Not a lot was coming in. He was releasing stuff independently. So like it was just a little bit of an imbalance there. Well, a bit, a bit fr- frivolous with the spending here. Yeah. So in 1996, flash forward, he returns to Warner Bros. Some weird stuff is happening. He, this year, married 22-year-old Maite Garcia, who was a former belly dancer, and he had met her when she was 16. Oh. Uh Uh-huh. Oh. So, I mean, I I listened to several interviews with Maite, and it, it all sounded very innocent. Like, it wasn't in a creepy way. Um... It's easy to make assumptions, though, when there's a big age gap. (laughs) I'm making assumptions. I I will try to take my brain away from that. Yeah. But it's, I mean, it's human nature. So she ended up getting pregnant, and their son, unfortunately, passed away from Pfeiffer syndrome, which is a rare skull defect when he was only a week old. Oh, that's so sad. Yeah. And the weird part is the two of them appeared on multiple talk shows, including Oprah, after the passing, like immediately following it, because there were rumors in the press that something had happened, and they were pretending like everything was fine. Like Oprah said, like what what's going on with your baby? And Prince is like, oh, everything's good. Like we're a family. Everything's good. Wait, even after their son had passed away. Yeah. And Maite was later quoted saying that she believed it was his way of processing the death. Yeah. Well, that's severe denial. Yeah, the first step, I guess, of grief. 
Um, but That's then, really sad. Yeah. So a little bit later, he was interviewed by Susie Boone about the trauma. And she recalled being taken aback when he addressed it. Like, he brought it up himself and was like, we're so upset. You know, our son passed away and blah, blah, blah. But she was also shocked by his warmth and humor throughout the whole interview. So hmm. as much as he despised doing interviews, he was actually just, like, super kind. And she was really... she felt compelled enough to speak about that publicly. So people, you know, started to alter their perception of him a little bit. But this ultimately led to him becoming more spiritual. So he really felt like, you know, this was a sign from God and we could go on about that. So Warner Bros. released Chaos and Disorder at this time, which was ultimately the last album they had of his to release fitting last name for (laughs) chaos and disorder he also released through emi a 3d set called emancipation so like all these names go together pretty well he also started uh really trying to not cuss anymore at this time which i thought was interesting he started a cuss jar to try to convince himself to stop swearing um i'd be so rich same (laughs) He also was quoted saying, when people say about me that I live in a prison and don't go anywhere, it's just not true. I go to the store, I go to the video store, I go to ballets, movies, the park. I live like anybody else, but I play music every day. So I wonder to what degree music actually helped him, you know, overcome the traumatic death of his son. But ultimately, Maite and Prince could not get over it. She ended up having, she got pregnant again, but it ended in miscarriage. So it was just too much for their relationship to take. And they ended up divorcing in 1998. So in 1999, he started selling independent albums on the internet. And he tried for a commercial comeback with Arista Records. And this album had guests like Cheryl Crow, who was very young and up and coming at the time, and Gwen Stefani. Oh, snap! Yeah. Gwen Stefani said, The first time I met him, this is my memory. He was wearing an all-purple velour jumpsuit with the collar that goes up, kind of like an Elvis jumpsuit, and high heels, and makeup. He was such a cool, amazing guy that just never turned off. Hell yeah. Like, he was really living that version of what you think he was. That was him. Now, on this album, Prince was credited as a producer, but the album was by his symbol name still. So he's still going by a symbol, but Prince, actual Prince, was credited as a producer, which I just think is kind of funny. That well, he now was. he's able to own the music, so... Yeah, I, I guess. Uh, but still was going publicly by a symbol, and everyone has said that, you know, no one referred to him as Prince in his inner circle anymore, but they would refer to him as, like, he or him, and that was it. Really? Yeah. While he was being called his symbol name. So. <laughs> It was also during this time that he, we always knew that he was a big sports fan, but allegedly at a concert in Montreal, he was watching a Bulls playoff game while he was doing guitar solos. So like they literally had a TV set up off stage and he would just be riffing on the guitar for the show, but he'd be watching the playoff game. <laughs> people can multitask like that too right and then one of the production assistants also had to hold up cue cards but instead of cue cards they were the scores <laughs> <laughs> which i just think is so fun like he had such diverse passions that you yeah. know he could give a full show and be fully invested in the show but also be fully invested in the nba playoffs i didn't know he was so into sports let's uh... yeah huge nba fan um, in 2000, the Revolution wanted to do a reunion tour, but he passed because one of the members, Wendy Melvoin, was gay, outwardly gay, and half Jewish. And he didn't want to do it because he was becoming, as you remember, more and more spiritual. And he tried to get her to convert. I'm sorry. Uh-huh. If you're going to have an album called Sexy Love, yeah, and then all of a sudden... <sighs> yeah. Hmm. Agreed. But this year, he did start calling himself Prince again. So the symbol just became that. It was a symbol of the time that he was the artist formerly known as Prince. And now I'm Prince again. (laughs) And snap my fingers, and I'm Prince again. Um, In 2000, he was also touring for his first live CD, which was called One Night Alone. And those close to him said around this time, he was evidently coming to terms with the fact that his star power was dwindling. So, like, he knew it, he felt it, but he ultimately decided that he didn't care. He was feeling more relaxed about it, and he was really just playing music because he loved it. That's crazy, though, because that's 2011, which feels like yesterday. 2000. 
Oh, I thought you said 2011. 2000. Oh, okay, sorry. Well, still. <laughs> but still. Like, still, not that long ago. In yeah. 2000, he was already like a household name. So you say his star power is dwindling, but he's still like, an oh, I- yeah. he's already an icon at that point. I mean, some of the first songs I downloaded on my iPod, the very first model of the iPod that came out were Prince songs. Oh, I probably got some on Spotify, not even Spotify, uh, LimeWire. LimeWire, yeah. thank you. <laughs> That's how I got mine. Downloaded it for a day and yep. got a virus. <laughs> exactly. As one does at that age. In 2001, he officially became a Jehovah's Witness which I don't know if you're familiar with a ton about that religion, but it's very interesting. They have very particular things that they have to follow. That took a hard left here. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. So he's feeling better, he's feeling relaxed, and then he's like, boom, Jehovah's Witness. But as we previously stated, he was becoming more and more spiritual since his son's passing. He evidently felt at home in the Jehovah's Witness community, and he actually tried for a while. He was going door to door to get people to convert. Well, yeah, because that's something you have to do, right? Mm-hmm. To convert. Oh, wow. Okay. Yep. Can you uh, imagine? <laughs> Your doorbell rings. You open it. It's just Prince in his heels and velour suit. Just, no. hello, what I... May I speak to you about our Lord and Savior? <laughs> what? I mean, people probably freaked out. Like, he's so famous at this point. It's like, <sighs> he's like, oh, not this again. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, go away, buddy. We don't want it. Anyways, in 2001, he also married Manuela Tassellini, who worked for a nonprofit. She's one of the people, actually, not to skip ahead, but she is one of the people that revealed his insane amount of anonymous charity work and activism. Hmm. She worked for a nonprofit. They clearly had mutual interests, and he never spoke publicly about the work that he was doing, but he did so much for charity. Like, so much. This year, his father passed away in August as well, so in 2001, and then five months after his father passed away, his mother passed away. And really just a rough year for him in that sense. And a lot of people that he was close with were really, really worried because he was, you know, his parents were so important to him. And I've mentioned that they might have had a complicated relationship, but those close to him noted that they were always around. He was always going to see them. Like, he had a very solid relationship with them at this point in his life. So to lose both of them back to back, like, that was... It's rough. It was pretty difficult. But nevertheless, he persisted. So... Great quote. (laughs) (laughs) We fast forward a little bit. I mean, I could talk about 2002 and 2003, but, you know, I want to keep it interesting. So we're going to fast forward to 2004. (laughs) That's my fast forward sound. Yours is way better. (laughs) I feel like my mom did that all the time growing up. I don't know why. (laughs) Peach things. Trying to fast forward through your life. Yeah. And 2004, he makes a Grammy's appearance with Beyonce and they performed a medley of his hits, which I recall watching. And it was really cool. Um, so he starts doing a lot more appearances. He's back in the public eye in that way. He did a performance for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which is one of the most played videos on YouTube. It's the rendition of While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Mm. It's with Tom Petty, Stephen Winwood. Oh, I've seen that. And yeah, Jeff yeah. Lynn, I think. And he just steals the show. It's mm-hmm. so good. Um, but 2004 is also when... <laughs> bringing it back to the NBA, Carlos Boozer. I don't know if you're familiar with that name, but he's absolutely not very prominent NBA player. He tells an amazing story about something that happened this year. So he bought a house in LA, Carlos Boozer did, and he was playing for the Utah Jazz at the time. So for the season, he was like, I'm going to rent out my house and make sure I'm not, you know, just <laughs> eating money on this. He didn't want to, but he was like, eh, you know, it is what it is. And someone offered him $95,000 a month for it. And they were completely anonymous. And he was like, okay, well, that's like a lot of money. So, you know, know, let's let's take a look. So he flies back to L.A. from Utah to sign the paperwork. And out of the limo, Prince emerges. (laughs) And Carlos Boozer is a huge fan. He's like, oh, "Oh my God. Like, what is happening? So he agrees to let Prince rent his house. He's like, this is the coolest thing ever. But during the season, he tore his hamstring. So he went home to L.A. to his house to rehab. But it's being rented out per their agreement. So he he just goes to the house to check on it. He pulls up. He's like, this is not my house. (gasps) What is going on? There's like a purple run all the way through the driveway, all the way up to the house. 
He's like, okay, let me go inside and see what's up. There's black and purple carpet everywhere. Oh, no. There's a picture of Prince in every room. His weight room had been turned into a nightclub. One of his guest rooms had been turned into a hair salon. Another one had been turned into a massage parlor. <laughs> one of the bathrooms had a purple heart mirror. He was like, oh, oh my God. Like, you I just straight up moved in and renovated the house. Yep. Yeah. And he was like, well, like, I don't want to be an ass, but this was not part of the arrangement that he could just completely make alterations to my home. Like, this is my house still. <laughs> and not slight ones. I mean, yeah. doing purple carpet everywhere. Uh-huh. Is- uh-huh. So Carlos Boozer is trying to call him and call him and call him. And he's like, dude, like, oh, my God, please answer. Like, we got to we got to talk about this. Meanwhile, his lawyer's like, we can sue him, you know. And Carlos Boozer's like, I'm not suing Prince. Like, I just want my house to go back to normal before yeah. he moves out. Oh, it's so sad. It's like one of your heroes does yeah. this to you. He's like, what? So he gets a call one day at three in the morning from Prince himself. And Prince is like, I'm so sorry. I'm on tour in Asia. But don't worry about anything. It'll look like I was never there. So Carlos Boozer's like, okay, like, I guess I have to believe him. Well, needless to say, he shows up however long later, and it's like nothing ever happened. Everything is completely back to normal. Like, completely back to normal. (laughs) No sign that he was ever there. How much money did they spend on the first renovations and then flipping <laughs> the it all back? Renovations. And because Prince rented the property, it sold for $4 million more than Carlos Boozer bought it for. Wow! So it was clearly worth it. But I love this story because it plays into, like, you've always heard stories about Prince being very, like, he just kind of appears and disappears <laughs> and, like, very ethereal and just this strange, There's a cloud like, of smoke behind him yeah, everywhere he goes. Yeah. Otherworldly presence, and this just made me laugh so hard because it's like, oh, it's a massage parlor, it's a hair salon, all this, and then snap your fingers and it's back to normal. Wouldn't you feel like you you are losing your mind? Like, yes. did I just imagine all of that? Uh-huh. A hundred percent. And to hear That's him amazing. tell the story is really funny because he's like, I was just so confused. Yeah. And like, what's going on? But the logistics side of me is like, okay, but really, how did they do that? Uh- they had to have like documented everything how it was mm-hmm. before to revert it back. What is the point? And he's on tour in Asia, so why did he even do it in the first place? I know. <laughs> I just think it's so great. The purple heart mirror in the back. I mean, the whole thing. Pictures of him in every room. It's just it's, it's gold, gold. So by 2005, there are a lot of not to switch gears from a fun story, but there are a lot of rumors around him having hip issues and needing a hip replacement. And this is problematic for a couple of reasons. One, being a Jehovah's Witness, you can't get surgery. You can't go under the knife. <laughs> so just a lot of stuff that is involved with that. And then also, like, from a performance standpoint, he did so many crazy things that people were like, well, how is that going to affect him, you know, on tour and stuff going forward? So there's still a lot of mystery around what actually happened. Some people say he got surgery. Some people say he didn't. But... Because he couldn't and he was in a lot of pain, it is known to be true that he relied on painkillers to help him through this time. Mm -hmm. He also had a residency in Vegas during this time, so he's performing a lot, which probably contributed to his hip issues in the first place. Yeah. By 2007, he made his Super Bowl halftime appearance, which I don't know if you recall, but I can totally recall because the Bears were in the Super Bowl at that time and my dad was freaking out. The whole game. Because of the Bears. Because of the Bears. Okay. But also, my parents loved Prince, so they were like, oh my gosh, this is the best Super Bowl ever. Like, the Bears are in it. Wait, don't tell me. Were they playing against the Patriots? They were not. Just kidding. They were playing against the Colts. But I'm trying. (laughs) That would have sounded so cool if I got that right. I would have been... We would have just ended the podcast. Like, I would have been (laughs) so proud of you. (laughs) Would have been so good. But there were, you know, as one does with Super Bowl appearances, there were 140 million viewers. So probably the biggest stage that you could ever be on as a performer. And it's such an honor to be asked and to read about the logistics. I won't go into it, but how it all came together with like the NFL meeting with Prince and like the production team and how the pieces just worked out perfectly. But I don't know if you remember watching this. It was in Miami, the Super Bowl, and the whole production team was super, super worried because Miami, it rains a lot, you know? With purple rain? So (laughs) this performance became known as one of the most iconic live performances of all time because, yet again, Prince is, like, floating around on the stage. It's pouring rain before purple rain starts, okay? (gasps) 
he doesn't even look like he's getting wet. Everyone was like, is there an umbrella over him that no one sees? Like, <sighs> what's going on? Just, like, otherworldly. And he made history with the performance. I mean, it was... People talked about it, still talk about it. It's, How did he not get wet? I want to know. He didn't get wet, and he didn't slip on the stage. That's what the production team was worried about. They were like, there's no way. He's wearing heels. He's moving around like crazy. Like, he's going to fall. And they just kept saying, he's going to fall, he's going to fall, he's going to fall. I slipped in macaroni salad at the grocery <laughs> store the other day. This guy can't, won't even slip in. Yeah. Wow. And so people kept referring to it as like divine intervention. And it was just like so perfect with the scene. I mean, it was drizzling the whole set through his 12 song set. But then before Purple Rain, it starts downpouring. Like you can't script Chills. it better than Chills. that. That's, yeah. We, I mean, you keep coming back to this, but saying that there is something otherworldly about There really is. How does he uh-huh. do all this? It kind of reminds me of like David Blaine almost. Yeah. Just stuff that doesn't necessarily make sense. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. So it's so poetic. So poetic. So again, one of the most noted and people consider it one of the best performances, live performances of all time. I mean, you can't beat it. And he. He made history and also agreed with everyone that he made history. <laughs> he was quite <laughs> saying. But just a really cool moment in his career because I think we've talked about it, but like his star power, he was still super famous and like, but he was doing a lot of, you know, repeats of his old hits and it's not like he was just still putting out music and album after album. So this was a big moment for him to have this kind of stage and just do such a great, amazing, otherworldly performance. So in 2010, He's named one of Time's 100 Most Influential People in the World, which is not surprising. But this year, he's also inducted into the American Music Hall of Fame. And yet again, people close to him noted that they noticed a shift in him around this time. It's like he started to just care less and laugh more and was like, you know what? This is my life. I want to live it. Yeah, I think it's just called getting older. (laughs) Exactly, right? It makes sense for where he was at in his career. And it seems like he was just having a good time playing music and, you know doing all that maybe it was like his faith too who knows yeah who's to say or the or the (laughs) painkiller all of the above all of the above for sure so this is also the time that he started getting really into the internet and (laughs) wait yeah really the the, (laughs) sorry continue that's just what does that mean so i'm gonna tell you okay sorry it (laughs) it made me laugh so hard to read this about prince like When you think of Prince, you think of just, like, insane guitar solos, like, his performances, like, to picture him sitting on a computer on the internet being like, oh, this is a funny YouTube video, just made me laugh. But he spent a lot of time actually looking up comedy. He also learned how to make memes and was, like, a huge meme maker at this time. He also really liked chat rooms and befriending bloggers who were fans of his. And so he, you know, get to know them online and they would lose their minds because they're like, oh, my God, we didn't know we were talking to Prince. And then it was revealed that it was Prince. They all thought it was a prank. And he's like, no, it's really me. And like it'd be confirmed to them. And he also used Twitter a lot, but he didn't know how to copy and paste. (laughs) And he thought you had to copy and paste stuff to retweet it. And his team tried to get him to like, no, you just have to hit this button and it'll retweet. But he wanted to copy and paste everything. (laughs) And people recalled him like trying to figure it out. And they would all just sit there and let him try to figure it out at this time. I mean, (laughs) who knows how to use Twitter? uh, Yeah. So he also like, I think what probably was the catalyst of this interest in the internet was he was very into YouTube to try to discover new artists and young musicians, which I think is so cool. I mean, we've kind of seen that theme throughout. He takes young artists under his wing, paid their mortgages, for goodness sakes. Like, he cares a lot, and he befriended a lot of those artists that then have gone on to speak really highly of him and how he made such an impact on them. In 2014, he appeared on an episode of New Girl because he loved the show. I'm I'm just trying to think of which I've seen all of them, but I haven't. Have you not seen the Prince episode? It's so iconic! Oh my gosh, uh, I can't remember. Like another thing we'll have to watch later. I but added to the queue. He literally reached out to them, not vice versa, because he was such a fan of the show and had started binge watching it, and he was like, "I want to be in the show." And so his team was like, "Okay." And the whole new girl stuff, they were like, "This is a joke, right?" Like, Prince it's, doesn't want to be on our show. He, it, this is a joke. It's crazy because that it, it's a. Great show. I love that show. Mm-hmm. But I'm surprised that's the one that he went I with. know. <laughs> There's so many other ones that you think he would be involved with yeah. first. And the cast has some amazing stories about when he actually filmed it. Like, they didn't know it was going to happen when it... 
they scheduled it because he was notorious for scheduling things and then pushing it and whatnot. But it happened. They all have really fond memories of it. Said he was absolutely amazing. So into it. But yet again, he like just disappeared off the set and then they never <laughs> saw him again. I mean, I guess Zoe Deschanel, she's a musician too. So they exactly. That. Yeah, but he played live music for them. Like, they genuinely had, like, a party while they were recording this. And fun. And then just bounced out. Just bounced out, per the usual. But if you haven't seen the episode, even if you don't watch New Girl, it's it's just a fun depiction of Prince and everything that he is. Because they make little nods to his disappearing, too, in the show. <laughs> oh, okay. It's, like, it's just very well done. And then, unfortunately, we fast forward again to 2016, and this is when he passed away. Mm-hmm. Um, as I you might, that. yeah, as you might recall, there was a lot of mystery around his death. At first, it was said that he had the flu, and the plane had to make an emergency landing when he was on his way home to Minnesota. They landed in Illinois. Then it was revealed that he died of an accidental fentanyl overdose. Oh, man. And people around him said that he was battling an opioid addiction that was kind of going unnoticed and undetected. Which goes back into the earlier thing about the hip, like maybe he didn't have surgery and the painkillers, because the pain just became too much, they overtook his life. Like, we really don't know. And for me, it's like, I don't want to remember Prince for passing away like that, right? Like, you want to remember him for all of his accomplishments and all the good stuff that he gave the world. Going out with a bang, not with, like, the worst drug imaginable. Ruined so many lives and F heroin, first of all, but fentanyl, like... I know. (sighs) It's brutal. How do we... I mean, this is a whole fil- philosophical thing we could go into, and we won't. But, I mean, <laughs> to think that, like, that drug is so consuming and, and powerful that, like, people as famous as Prince get their hands on it is just so wild to me. Agreed. And there's a lot of stuff, I think, still going on with the doctor, his doctor of the time, and his family and his estate, like... As you can imagine, with any untimely deaths, I mean, that stuff happens, especially when someone's so famous. But you can, up until the pandemic, which is when we're recording this, you can tour Paisley Park. Like, they opened it to the public Mm. and um, kind of see his legacy in person. But, yeah, I mean, he... There's no doubt, this really sad passing aside, I mean, he was a prolific musician. People, actually, after his death, it became even more known how prolific he was. And it was discovered in his vault that he had so much unreleased music that if they wanted to release it, a new album, an entire album, could be released every year for the next century. No. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, that's how much unreleased wow. stuff yet. The vault, the vault, the back. vault. So who knows? Maybe one day we'll get to hear some unreleased Prince music if mm. it ever surfaces. But yeah, I mean, I think we have to decide now, Kate. Obviously, he lived a very complex life, very complicated life, a lot of ups and downs. But ultimately, was he the worst? Uh, I. I'm going to say a firm no on this one. I mean, we, a lot of people we cover, it's like, I don't know, maybe. And there are definitely things that were extremely problematic in his life. Totally. But it sounds like there was a lot of good, too. He just was trying to get his footing. He's trying to find peace and happiness somehow. Yeah. But, our, oh man, so much amazing music. And film, apparently. Yeah. That's our next mission is to find all these films. Uh-huh. No, I agree. And I think it's it's hard to give a, a yes on someone like Prince. I mean, he, I have to say researching him was so fun because he touched so many people's lives. Like he was one of those people that built people up with him mm-hmm. and especially women. Like he was a big champion of women musicians and was always trying to get them on a bigger stage and a bigger platform, young musicians all the famous people that are obsessed with him. I mean, there are celebrity stories for days. I picked a few of my favorites to include in here, but I could have included, we could have done an entire episode just on celebrity anecdotes about Prince, Hmm. Um, which I think it just speaks to the type of person, those that knew him closely, like that's how he impacted them. And I think that's, there's a lot of weight with that. He's just so insanely creative. And to hear, I I didn't know all that stuff about like his son passing and stuff, just, yeah. Sounds like he went through a lot of trauma, obviously battling with some sort of addiction issue. But yep. um, man, the guy who just performs in the rain without getting wet, how <laughs> can you can't hate that guy? No, the, the whole mystery around him, I think, 
just makes me like him even more. Mm -hmm. And who really knows? I mean, all signs point to behind the closed doors. He was just an awesome dude and just a normal guy from Minnesota trying to live his life. Wow. Um, Great job. That was amazing. I'm blown away. I'm really glad that I got to tell that story. And I'm, I really hope that people will tell us their favorite Prince stories. Yeah. I was going to say we, there's obviously a lot, but we want to hear it. So let us know or let us know how wrong we are (laughs) tell us your favorite prince anecdotes tell us everything that you loved or hated about him there's so much to go through and we can't wait to hear from you on that so please let us know podcast at designpickle.com yeah and we'll be back next week to try to figure out who actually is the worst yeah we will we're gonna find him we'll find him we'll get there (laughs) we're saying him it could be a her we'll find them could be an it who knows (laughs) Uh, but if you want to find out with us, make sure to uh, subscribe, follow, all that fun stuff. And we'll be back with more, more creatives who are the worst. Until then, go watch Purple Rain and listen to the best, most iconic song ever. Mm, let's go do that now. Okay, bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to Creatives Are the Worst. If you like what you're hearing, or if you think that we're the worst, please leave us a review on your podcast platform of choice. We'd love to hear from you. You can also contact us directly at podcasts at designpickle.com and a big thanks to Design Pickle for sponsoring the show. Join us next week as we once again try to answer the question, are creatives the worst?